the heavens are telling of the glory of God. Look up and seek His wisdom from above. Thank you for tuning in. One of the rules we'll study in this video actually deals with one of the biggest problems creating misunderstandings of Bible truth. If you're popping into the middle of this series, we're on video number 30, and I hope you'll consider going back and watching the whole series. In the previous three videos, we learned five rules for understanding sentences and saw their importance. Now let's pull in the rest of our rules for understanding simple sentence structures. Number six. Figurative language must be interpreted according to the rules that govern figures of speech. There are a whole set of rules that clarify this area, so I'm not going to dwell on it here. We'll actually devote several videos to this subject later on in our study. Number seven, positive truth is sometimes established by negative expressions. Now that sounds a little bit confusing, but let me illustrate. It's very simple when we apply it. If I tell you that you will die if you do not eat, that's pretty negative, isn't it? Then you know that you must eat to live. That's the positive side of that. If you read, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish, you know that you must repent to live. Well, that's from Luke 13, verses 3 and 5. When the author of Hebrews, in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, tells us that without faith it is impossible to please him, we know that we must have faith in order to please him. Now we must beware that we not misuse this rule, as we shall see in the next rule. Number eight, sentences that express truth about one fact do not necessarily preclude other facts that may not be under consideration. We must beware of assuming that one fact always negates other possibilities. While this may sometimes be true, we can only know it by a thorough examination of facts and their circumstances. That one must repent to live, for example, does not preclude other essentials. Jesus was simply pointing out that his hearers were no better than others they looked down upon. When we fail to induce all of the facts in a case, we've fallen for a fallacy of partial evidence. I sometimes call it an error of preclusion. To preclude is to exclude other possibilities. To accurately exclude anything because of a statement, an exclusive arrangement must be proved, not assumed in convenience, you know, because we like to believe something a certain way. Saying that Bob is a son does not mean he's not a husband or father, nor would it exclude the possibility of him being a preacher or an author. David was a king but that did not preclude his being a prophet, Acts 2 and verse 30. We cannot say that he was not one because he was the other. Not only was David a king and a prophet at the same time, Jesus is now our prophet, priest, and king. That people were ever commanded to do something does not preclude their obligation to do something else. As I mentioned a moment ago, telling people they must repent does not mean there are no other requirements. Luke 13 verses 3 and 5 tell us to repent, but we must also believe, John 8 and verse 24, that faith is essential to everlasting life does not preclude the necessity of repenting or even being baptized. Jesus commanded the apostles not to go in the way of the Gentiles, Matthew 10 and verse 5. But that does not preclude a change when his law went into effect, and the Holy Spirit did later reveal the inclusion of the Gentiles, Acts chapter 10. As I said at the beginning, this is one of the biggest problems people have in interpretation. Violating this rule becomes a handy way of cutting out passages we don't want to honor. Some very sincere people do this, and that should warn us to be very careful about how we handle Scripture.